go ahead and call the joint committee on finance to order. I'll let the clerk take a silent roll call and look to the co chairman for a motion on the minutes. I move that we approve the minutes of the previous meeting of April 17. Motion is on approval of minutes from the previous meeting of April 17. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. Here the ayes have the minutes are adopted. Next item on the agenda is a review of the fiscal year 23 budget year match. And we have Secretary Tim Hardy here, I believe, to kick that off. Tim Hardy, you want us to the podium here? Welcome back to Joint Finance. Thank you very much. Good morning to everybody. Uh, as I said, I've got the, the easiest job in the state. I guess you report good news every month. So let me just give you an up to date. As we know, Fiscal year 23 is coming close to the end. We can, we can see the end at this point. And uh, everything is pretty much headed on target. We started saying last fall that we were going to have a $1.7 billion surplus. And that, was, that came from Mark Nico, not me. And I was skeptical, but as of this morning, the surplus number as of May 5th, last Friday, is $1.617 billion. And I, I read some media discussions recently about what does the surplus mean or not mean and can we adjust the surplus so as as I started doing about three or four months ago I started saying I'm not going to talk about surplus I'm going to talk about percentage growth and as year to date here's the percentage growth on our main revenue sources the personal income tax as of the end of April is up nine percent from last year at the end of April so we grew 10 twelfths of the way through the fiscal year. So we grew by 9%. Two questions that we're getting on personal income tax right now. One is the effect of the tax cut. The tables went out for our employers across the state, went up on taxes website, the withholding tables, about March 24th. So the state of West Virginia threw a lot immediately to the updated withholding table. Uh, the CPA community, uh, taxes work very hard with the tax preparation community, the CPA community. Taxes website has been improved and is much better. They completely redid the website. And our tax commissioner, Matt Irby, as late as last week, was doing educational <laughs> webinars for the accounting and the public community in the chamber on the effect of these new tax withholding tables. But as we know, when you turn the state's finances, it's like turning an aircraft carrier. It goes real slow. So right now, we are watching and monitoring the effect of the lower income tax rates. And, and we see that effect through the new withholding tables and through the fact that people are starting and will be adjusting their estimated income tax payments. They adjusted them in and of course we have June 15th, estimating personal income tax payments. So we'll see that effect, but the, the most of the effect we'll see in fiscal year 24. Our original projection way back in January, and, and that number basically stayed pretty much solid, but it would have about $160 million of effect on fiscal year 23, this fiscal year. So you're really, we're watching it happen in slow motion. And rest assured, every single business day, we're looking at those personal income tax numbers and monitoring and looking for trends. And Mark and his crew do that every day. Uh, the other thing that we're getting a lot of calls about, and they're, they're positive, but is the, what we call, if you remember the SALT bill. The bill where we uh, changed the limitation on state and local taxes. That's where the acronym SALT comes from. And that bill, if you remember, passed by the legislature, is effective retroactive to January 1st, 2022. So we have worked very hard. Tax, uh, I, I talked to a couple of CPAs last week from Beckley. We've worked very, very hard with the CPA community, tax preparation community, to help everybody understand the effect of that bill, because that one's different. It affects the income taxes for county year 22. We don't do that very often. Where we, where bills passed and it goes back to a previous year. So those are the two big issues. Right? The effect of the tax cut, the withholding tables, which we got out timely, and how do we 
address the sawmill. And the, the accounting community is working very hard with tax, and I have encouraged tax. And they are doing it. I'm very proud of them to get out there and be proactive with the business community and the public in general on educating everyone. <coughs> with respect to our other revenue sources, again, these are percentages. Uh, year to date, consumer sales tax is up 6.6%. Corporate net, 17.8%, and severance tax, 48.1%. If you add all that up, our, our revenue at the end of April, general revenue was up 14.1% from a year ago. That's math. That's not uh, debating anything other than just math. That's pure math. Our revenue stream increased by 14.1%. From April 30th, 22 to April 30th, 23. With respect to other things that are going on in the budget, interest income. Last year, fiscal year 22, our interest income, wait for this, was negative. It was literally negative uh, due to a lot of things that occurred in the bond market. <coughs> this year, interest income is up nearly $100 million. So that's the effect of the markets coming back, the federal government, the Fed raising the interest rates. We're seeing a lot more revenue on our short term money. Keep in mind, if you're a treasury investor, I go to the position of the treasurer's office to see handles take short term cash. And they are managing about $10.4 billion cash right now. Now that's not all cash that's ready to be spent. A lot of that's in special funds, but they're doing a really, really good job uh, capturing these higher interest rates. And that, that gives us a, a windfall of money that we were not expecting. So overall, things are really good. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mark for his PowerPoint and his deep dive. And Mike Cook, Courses there on the wall. Mike's always anxious to get a speech. I'm sure he'd like to come out and give one, but he's here to answer any questions. So that's all I have, Mr. Chairman, unless there are questions. Go ahead and maybe do questions. Okay, thank you very much. Mark, welcome back. Um, I'm Mark Nico, uh, Deputy Secretary for Revenue, and we might use better place to have a uh, handout. The first page of the, the handout on revenues is the summation year-to-date revenues through April. That's 10 months out of 12 months, two months to go in a year. And uh, I won't get into all the stuff on, on this chart because Dave, I think, did a good summary of what was going on. But here to date, uh, we've collected $669 million more than we collected last year. 13.1% increase, $1.585 million above uh, the official estimate. And uh, all the uh, major components are doing well the sales tax, the personal income tax up 5%, uh, uh, BO is even up 5.4%. You notice the insurance tax shows a negative $22.8 million. Uh, we have successfully transferred $23.4 million to the uh, three medical schools in the state during the year. So if you put the $23.4 million back into that number, uh, compared to last year, we're up just a little bit compared to last year on insurance premium taxes. Uh, the only uh, tax that's down is, and it usually goes down a little bit every year, is, is tobacco taxes. Uh, tobacco taxes are down about 4.6%. The decline rate recently has been a little bit steeper than we usually you usually get about uh, one and a half to two percent per year. It's a little bit steeper than, than, than the normal that way. On the severance tax drop, 48.1 percent increase year to date. That's also good news for local governments. We have completed all of the uh, severance tax distributions to local governments for this fiscal year. And those distributions collectively were 96 percent above last year, uh, an increase of 46.2 million dollars for local governments uh, in, in aggregate. And uh, there were a couple of counties that are actually have seen coal production in the last 12 months that hadn't seen coal production for a few years. So uh, the higher prices has tended to open up maybe a couple of mines that, uh, that, that were uh, idle in the recent past. 
Let's move on to the next slide. Next slide is just April in isolation. In April collections, we did very well. We collected 825.9 million. That's the first month that I did. And recall was collecting over 800 million dollars. That was 319 million dollars above the initial estimate and 4.4% uh, ahead of last year. Uh, the, the, you know, the revenue growth rate is slowing down over time for a number of different reasons. Uh, inflation is slowing down over time, so that's part of it. We have uh, some tax cuts that are coming into play, so that's part of it. And then energy prices are also retreating a bit as well. On the sales tax front, we're up 5.3% year to date. Or, I mean, for the month of April, isolation. Uh, personal income taxes were actually up 5.4% in, in April. Uh, an interesting mix of dynamics there. The uh, withholding taxes were up over 20%, 20.5% for the month. Uh, estimated income tax payments were down 10%. Uh, return payments were down about 24%, which is in line with the federal return payments. But the, the big item was uh, what I call non-resident withholding, which uh, is where the pass-through entities are. And that was up uh, close to 400 percent, or well over 50 million dollar increase there, and that's so that's related to the uh, Senate Bill 151 that passed. Um, and since it was retroactive, that meant uh, uh, businesses had to pay by the April deadline. It also meant that some individual owners do not have to pay taxes. And the next bag there, and those individual owners will get uh, get that money back as a tax credit when they file their final return for 2022. So it's, a, it's an accounting change designed to uh, to help folks with their federal uh, tax returns. Uh, now on the um, uh, note there, the severance tax from this is down 35% in April uh, from last year, even though it's above estimate by 17 and a half million. Uh, energy prices have gone down recently, particularly natural gas prices starting most, for the most part in January. Natural gas prices right now are running a good 70% below where they were last year. So some of that price decrease is beginning to filter into the tax collection realm. Uh, the coal industry prices have been a bit firmer, but uh, even in the coal industry, we're seeing uh, lower prices than we saw last year, particularly for metallurgical coal. Um, the, that's about all for that page. The next slide. Is the uh, regular severance tax trends from the? Um, I, I did this on a sixth of the month and a fifth of the month because otherwise there's a bunch of noise in there because the tax is only due on the last day and it, it varies across months. And uh, we kind of peaked in in April over a 12 month basis at one, a little over one billion dollars. Um, one billion, eight, uh, not April. We peaked in February at 1.08 billion dollars, and we've de decreased a little bit since then. And as of April 23, it's 1.038 billion dollars. Um, that uh, that little bit of a decline curve it, it will continue in, in future months, and we were expecting that to, to happen. Next slide shows the individual uh, severance tax components. Uh, the blue line is the full severance tax. It's a uh, 12 month trillion basis, $360.8 million. Uh, natural gas, 640, almost $647 million. Oil at about $51.7 million, and, and all other resources, mostly gas, liquid, 96 million. Next slide, which I believe is the final slide, is the state road fund. You want to take a look at that on a year to date basis. So, on a year to date basis uh, through April, uh, most of the west side tax structures are a little bit above estimate, 1.8 million. Did about 1% ahead of last year. Registration fees have recovered quite a bit from last year, uh, still running below the official estimate, but 4.4% ahead of last year at this time. And sales tax on motor vehicles. Is up 4.4 percent year to date, uh, and then miscellaneous is up over a thousand percent. But that's because we put 150 million dollars, uh, legislature appropriated 150 million dollars for roads back earlier in this fiscal year, and that's the bulk of that increase. So out of the 175 million dollars of state funding for roads, 150 million dollars of that was a general revenue fund appropriation, and the other 25 uh, million dollars was natural growth. Uh, I think I also mentioned yesterday that the uh, uh, federal reimbursements uh, are up from last year about 29 percent uh, to 525.9 million dollars. So we're likely to have a record year of reimbursements. It was asked yesterday why that's occurring. Uh, the state is spending a whole lot more money on roads, uh, putting down the bond proceeds. And if we get into bridge projects and special projects, the funding match the federal level varies by the type of project you're doing. Uh, that raises the federal match. And then the federal government has also, uh, uh, through some congressional appropriations, has added the potential for even more uh, 
federal funding for roads uh, happen. So that's any questions. Any questions for either of the speakers? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Mark, uh, I believe both you and Dave have have made reference uh, during previous presentations, I think at our last interims, regarding the refundable tax credit on personal vehicles. And I've had a few constituents ask me about that. And could you run through that one more time, just so as people start to contemplate their payment of their personal property taxes for the coming year, uh, how they might consider paying those in order to maximize their uh, their tax benefit. The, uh, what we're referring to is effectively income tax cuts. And the income tax cut is, is uh, it comes in two parts. The first part was the rate reduction that occurred this year in 23. The second part will be the refundable tax credits that will start in 24, at calendar year 24. So that's going to be based upon what property taxes you actually pay in calendar year 24. So any tax you pay here in calendar year 23 is not going to count. It starts a year later. And you'll get that benefit back when you file your annual return for 24, which will be in early 2025. You file those annual returns, the tax credit will be part of the return process uh, for both businesses and individuals. Um, the, the tax has to be timely paid. The statute requires time of timely payment. So uh, uh, there are some people, not many, but there are some people that pay all their tax on September 1st. Um, the advice would be if you want credit for, for and, and tax is paid two stones, September and then the second storm is due in March. Property tax. So if, if you want to get full, uh, credit for uh, some of that tax, you pay, you're required to pay half the tax. At least there you pay half the tax September uh, of 23. You pay the other half the tax timely by March uh, 1st of 2024. You get credit for that payment in 24, and then the, the second payment would be in September of 24. It has to be timely paid. If you if you wait until uh, you, you register your vehicle with DMV, and DMV tells you, you where's your property tax receipt, so, oh, I gotta I gotta pay that. You go down to your assessor's office and, and, and pay the tax for the county sheriff. That's too late. If you, you pull out your personal property return, uh, you have to pay the tax penalty when you get credit. Yeah. And just a brief follow up on that. So if, if you were to do as you suggested and pay the half in March of 2024, second half of 2023 in March of 2024, could you also then pay the full payment in the fall of 2024 and capture all of that back in a rebate? You should get. Okay, so you would get the equivalent of one and a half times personal property tax back if you did it in that manner. In the first year you get one and a half times so the follow-up years thereafter is going to go back to one. That's the maximum. Uh, the way the revenue flows for property tax, not many people pay all their tax or lump sum, but there are some. I have a question. On the on the personal income tax collections and the growth of uh, 9% over the year over year. How much of that, do you have numbers on breaking it down? How much of it is just wage growth versus new people in the workforce growth? Uh, when you get new people in the workforce, the workforce has grown a little bit, not that much. I think the bulk of it is going to be wage growth. Uh, I, can get, I don't have the numbers handy here to look at it, but we have a little bit of an increase in the overall employment, but it's not, it's not earth shattering. Uh, and the bulk of it is, is, is higher wages, particularly probably in the healthcare sector. Yeah, and you know the, the construction sector sometimes pulling pretty good high, higher wages as well. Uh, year to date, withholding taxes on them, which comes to wages salary is up 10.9 percent. So actually, the withholding tax has grown a little faster than the overall tax. Uh, estimated tax, even though we had a 10 percent decline in April, and part of that may be related to Senate Bill 151, as well as the income tax cut. We're up 11.2 on estimated tax for the year, and. Uh, uh, Refunds are actually down a little bit. Refunds are done at the federal level as well. We're down about 2.8 percent. But but uh, I, I was, wages though are, are a big part of that. Wages. Although some of it is going to be the, the higher employment numbers, but I think the probably the weight weight of put a higher weight on, on wage increases a little bit lower weight on employment. Questions? Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Questions? Yeah. Um, thank you, Mark. Can you give me just a high level uh, 
overview of how you will determine the estimates for next year, seeing that we've had this growth for several years, but now we're going to have the tax cut. How, how will you determine that so that we're not seeing, we're more in track with our actuals and our estimates? Well, the, uh, the official estimate set by the governor in the last couple of years has been based on the uh, on budget request uh, and not on actual revenue performance. Okay. Now, um, the, uh, the budget is, is still conservatively set as approved by the legislature. So uh, what I will we'll see is uh, a little less slack in the, in the future rather than the big slack that we have right now. The revenues will move down closer to the estimate. And then sometime between now and July 1st, uh, we should be getting a, a revised official estimates for fiscal year 24 because of all the changes going on. Now the bottom line is going to stay the same uh, as far as the map, unless somebody has a change of heart. Uh, bottom line stays the same, uh, but we will reconfigure the, the, the numbers. So the personal income tax revenue estimate will go down a bit, the sales tax estimate will go up, there will be some other changes within the, within the mix uh, the next fiscal year. Um, fiscal year 25, we'll, we'll, uh, when those estimates are prepared, that will also have to take into account mm -hmm. the second wave of income tax cuts that are going to happen in 24, which will affect fiscal year 25 uh, collections. So we're, we're working on that, but there is a, at, this, at this point in time, there's, a, there's enough slack in the, between uh, the official revenue estimate and uh, collections to do with the tax cut, which should be Okay, that makes a lot more sense to me now that the estimates are just what what we'll set the budget at. This is what we will allow to be spent on it. That, that's uh, what the governor's chosen to set the estimates to, to conservatively to, to match the budget. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Any further questions? I'm missing somebody. Thank you very much. So uh, next on the, uh, the agenda, we've, we're going to have three different speakers come up that from local area around here that are going to talk about uh, economic developments happening in this area. And uh, those three speakers, one's going to be Steve Williams, who's mayor of Huntington, uh, West Virginia, and then we'll be having Kelly Sabonia, who's president of the county commission here in Campbell <laughs> County, and then we'll be having John Musgrave, who's executive director of Mason County Development Authority. I want to ask that each speaker do well, 20 minutes. I'll hold you 20 minutes. You can't hold yourself 20 minutes. And then, uh, and then we'll do questions. That way everybody has a chance to, to kind of follow through on the questions. So, uh, Mayor Williams, welcome to the Joint Finance Committee for the Senate. Or in the, in the House. Sorry. Uh, Senator, it's an honor to be able to be with all of you uh, <clears throat> today, particularly to be able to talk about uh, the economic development advancements that we've been having in our community. First and foremost, thank you for the efforts that you've been making in recent years to actually make West Virginia a go-to state. Thank you also uh, for the support and in infrastructure development. Our city really uh, found itself that over a 60-year period, virtually nothing was being done infrastructure. Now we have the resources to be able to do some things and uh, as you came into Huntington uh, you saw along How Greer Boulevard uh, the construction that is going there. The one thing that we're finding is that the partnership that we have with highways certainly with commerce um, a um, department of uh, uh, Health and Human Resources, um, the Tax Department, uh, Secretary Hardy and, and his team, the, the partnership that we have enables us to be able to do things that uh, previously were never even thought as being possible within Huntington. Our strategy, our economic development strategy started 10 years ago in essence with this underlying concept is that we would not be insular and just trying to move Huntington forward. Anything that we would be doing had to be done with a lens towards regional growth. To the north, at Mason, at Mason County. Certainly we're not taking credit for what John Musgrave has done, but we know that we're benefiting from it. To, to the east in, in Putnam County, uh, to the south, um, Wayne County and other 
counties uh, further south from us, but even to the west in Ohio and Kentucky. Uh, our efforts began when Frontier Communications uh, partnered with the Weather Channel and the Dish Network, challenging small cities around the country from a population of 8,000 to 80,000 to put together an economic revitalization plan. They came in to, to meet with us, and we saw that there was an opportunity, an opportunity to do something that is beyond what a small city would be able to do. And frankly, those who were involved in the ABC competition, frankly, they looked at what we were doing and saying, a small city can't do that. Because our focus was not on just identifying one area to develop, i.e. the ACF Industries right next to Marshall University. We saw that if we were going to move the, move the needle, move the bar in Huntington, <coughs> that we had to lift those areas that have been down, uh, have begun to decline because of factories and businesses closing right next to Marshall University, American Car Boundary. Started in 1872. Ended up going out of business in the early 21st century, a little over, I think, maybe just before the year 2000. They shut down. Lent Pigments, and more recent, right in the same area next to Marshall University, it shut down. The neighborhood next to it, the High Lawn neighborhood, you see the housing starting to decline, people moving out. Same thing happened in the West End, a quarter of a mile, a quarter of a mile off of the interstate, where companies were closing down, factories were closing down, the housing started to decline. We weren't taking full advantage of 20 million cars a year passing by the, by the city, we weren't taking full advantage of that because as they would drive by, you'd look over just to the left. You would think right there next to the interstate that at it, that area would boom. But what we found is it was akin to being a quarter of a mile from the river and found yourself dying from thirst because you haven't figured out how to get water to you. <laughs> the problem wasn't necessarily that the interstate was built around Huntington. The problem was is that we weren't planning properly. Very, I'm very fortunate. I've been mayor now for 10 years, and the plans that we started putting in place in 2013, we have been doggedly determined to make sure that we're continuing to move towards those. 10 years, we were, 10 years ago, we saw ACF and the High Lawn area. Um, Corbin factory in the West End, 14th Street West was a or is a antique district, but it really wasn't growing at the level that it could. As you're coming in, as I pointed out, with the reconstruction on Hal Greer Boulevard, being able to uh, right connecting Cabell Huntington Hospital. Marshall University building their pharmacy school. Marshall University right down at the foot of, uh, of uh, Hal Greer Boulevard, that entire area. The markets are going to speak by themselves, but we've got to make sure that what we are doing is enabling that to, to occur. As a result, we've seen opportunities that are developing in the Fairfield neighborhood as the Hal Greer Boulevard. High Lawn, we've acquired ACF Industries, and right next to it, there is a, a developer that bought the Flint, uh, Flint Pigments and property. That's 100 acres right next to a university with water, rail, highway, the river right next to it. All of that sitting right next to a university and all of the research and development that is possible there, that is prime property to be re redeveloped. And then what we also saw down in the West End, where the Corbin factory used to be, 
Cofield Development Corporation acquired Black Diamond Industries, and that property is being redeveloped for solar panel installations and, and such as that. The partnership that we have with the Department of Environmental Protection uh, and what we're in what we are doing with Brownfields, once again, partnership. We're proud to say that the state of West Virginia and Division of Highways has been a strong partner, as I've indicated. In November of 2022, Triton Construction was awarded a $13.5 million contract to renovate Calgary Boulevard from Washington, Washington Boulevard all the way down to Third Avenue. As I indicated, DEP was also a critical partner in the Brownfields remediation process for the 42-acre site at ACF. We also are in the midst of an engineering phase. If you've ever come through Huntington at one time, if you would try to come in on the 10th Street Viaduct underpass and the 8th Street underpass, and there was a rain, rain squall that was coming in, they would flood, and then you'd have to try to backtrack as to how to be able to get downtown. And heaven forbid, if you were going east to west, 3rd Avenue and 5th Avenue around 24th Street, near where ACF was, all of that property would be, would be flooding as, as well. What we ended up finding, there was no stormwater system in the High Lawn area because when it was developed, it was higher land and they didn't have stormwater. And now we're having to build that ourselves and we're in the midst of engineering a phase of what will be the largest set of local infrastructure projects in the same in, in the state's history, updating our sanitary and stormwater system. Our secret sauce is very simply this. If you're looking to come in and be able to get something done and partner with us, you can will doesn't matter who you are, we're going to do business with you. Communication, collaboration, builds partnerships. That's why it's an honor to be able to be with Commissioner Sabonia and with uh, Mr. Musgrave. You know, what we are finding, communication, collaboration, creates partnerships. We know what the result is. We start communicating, talking with one another. We begin to trust one another. At that point, there is hope. And that hope creates the opportunity for us here. As a result, we're seeing more economic growth in our community than we have seen in, in decades. What really surprised me earlier this year is I was preparing my state of the city address. I asked, I knew, I knew that we had a lot of projects that we had in place. 2013 to date, how much have we invested? My background's in finance, and I'm always looking at every dollar that comes in, how do we leverage that to additional dollars? Particularly government funding. If it's a dollar coming in, I want at least five dollars. Frankly, it has been well beyond that. What we found is, $514,700,000 has been committed, spent, and we are in the midst of designing and building $514,700,000 of projects in, in our city. That leveraged would be well over a billion dollars of investment to the area. That's a result of what you all have been doing with our tax policy, with infrastructure funding. What Huntington is doing is an indication of what every community in the state can be doing, and it's an honor for us to be able to serve our citizens in that regard, but also to be able to point to other areas of the state saying, if Huntington can do it, surely God, you can too. I'll be glad to answer any questions at the close. Thank you. Do you have any questions? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman um, and Mayor. Thank you for being here. 
Um, so I've been going through uh, your, your handout. Appreciate uh, putting that together. Um, from a state perspective, do you know how much of these projects or what percentage of the dollars have been funded uh, by the state or dollars available to the state? I don't have that specific dollar amount that I can point to everything that we're doing. Certainly, uh, the state has been a partner in helping us with loans at ACF. State has been a partner with us in being able to uh, develop our, our brownfields remediation program. That's also the same in West in Westmoreland at uh, uh, Black Diamond, and you know certainly what is occurring along Algier Boulevard. Uh, those are just scratching the surface, but as you start to look down at uh, these facilities are broken down to order investments. I think you have this, this sheet, city owned facilities, seven projects, um, programs advan advancing the quality of life, nine projects, transportation, that certainly would be the state, economic development would be the state, 13 transportation projects, eight economic development projects, the storm, sewer and stormwater, we have been camped out um, at the IJDC meetings uh, of recent and it's amazing how we have been working with one another. We just tonight on tonight's agenda, the Department of Highways has come in and indicated certain eight bridges along the Four Pole Creek area that need to be redone. Uh, as it looks right now, there will be minimal match at this at the city level, if not no match at the city level. Once again, as I indicated. Collaboration and partnerships creates the opportunity. Uh, well, I appreciate that, Mr. Mayor, and, and um, I'm glad that you've been able to, to put forward a, you know, a significant investment. Um, looking at some of these projects, um, I think it's great. Do you have totals uh, for the city of Huntington's, uh, as, as we're talking about the economic development taking place here? Do you have totals on you know private sector payroll um, over the last 10 years and what that trend is? Or like that. That, that data. Uh, it's certainly, as uh, called Secretary Hardy, Hart, and uh, I know I have access to, to that immediately. Um, then there's there's one additional question that I had uh, related to the city owned facility projects. Um, it, it came to my attention that the city of Huntington purchased Pullman Square. Uh, from a from a private developer, I think was the cost on that roughly seven million dollars. Um, can you can you help me understand um, sort of uh, how that played into economic development and the reason for, for that purchase? What we found um, in our annual meeting with the leadership of uh, Pullman Square um, that the partnership. Of the five partners, three of the partners were looking to sell their interests. Um, it caused great concern for us. As you all have come to see, our downtown is pretty special right now, and it's precious and needs to be protected. As uh, we were sitting, having conversations of how we were going to, to do this, um, we used rescue plan money, American Rescue ARPA money to for uh, buying that stake is that we felt it was necessary to do everything that we could to protect that which we have right now and protect it for, for the future. Because if somebody of those, that majority interest would be uh, purchased by other entities that have absolutely, or investors that have no historical context as to how this project came about and that we felt that we needed to protect our our interests and with that we started uh, consulting with um, uh, with the Treasury and us uh, and uh, US Department of Treasury on the ARPA regulations to make sure that we could actually spend that money for something like this and once we got the go ahead said we absolutely had to we couldn't walk away walk away from it we needed to do what we could to protect the downtown because i think 
everybody who has been here and spent the night <clears throat> recognizes this is a pretty special environment that we have right now. It's our responsibility to protect. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you, Mayor, for attending. I had uh, the occasion recently to tour the wastewater treatment plant, which is the members of the committee look on the back of it. On the fourth page, it mentions 143 million for the wastewater plant upgrade, which after having spent the half a day going through that is very much needed. But one of the points that I would like to ask, and it is my understanding, Mr. Bracey took me around our facility. That is not really a city of Huntington project. That services way more of Western West Virginia than I ever imagined. So would you like to elaborate on what the real service area of that particular project is? Service area goes on into the Bee Ridge area, on deep into, into Wayne County and the Spring Valley, uh, Cerrito and Canova also uh, use our, our treatment uh, plant facilities, uh, Northern Wayne, um, and uh, it's our sanitary treatment uh, facility is the largest uh, facility in the state, um, much larger than any other city uh, around. And uh, again, this is an example, the last time of a major investment in our uh, sanitary treatment facilities is 1962. There is a secondary treatment plan when uh, um, Senator Jennings Randolph was was in office with Senator Byrd. There was a secondary treatment facility that was built in the early 80s. That's the only other investment that, that has occurred. Now, um, there will be some that will say, well, you raised rates significantly. Yes, we did. And the reason was is that we our rates were so low. This well, our rates are so low we didn't qualify for federal assistance. In order to be able to actually, with all of the largesse that is coming, well, if it's coming, by God, I want some of it ourselves, and we would have not <coughs> qualified uh, for it. And as a result, we did have significant uh, rate increase. What we're pleased to, to, to be able to show is that uh, right at uh, $50 million has been approved with, through uh, uh, the IJDC committee. And that uh, uh, once again, this is a partnership that we end up having with the state. Any questions? Okay. Thank you, Mayor Williams. Thank you very much. Next to the agenda is President of the County Commission. We've got Kelly Spong. Thank you, Mr. President. That sounds better than delegate. I'm making my point in our city. That's a good time because it's great to catch up with a lot of old faces and meeting new faces. But, uh, we did have a, an amazing opportunity today before us having the mayor of our um, Jewel City, Huntington, uh, county commissioners are here, as well as the legislature, and it is about partnerships. Um, the mayor was very much correct. Um, we have had a lot of new in Cabell County and the Cabell County Commission. Typically, you have every two years, it's a six year term, so you have, have every two years um, a new commissioner could potentially be elected. And we had the unfortunate death of longtime commissioner Nancy Cardinal. And so we had two um, different seats up for county commission on this last election cycle. And so I would like to take a minute to introduce our two new, our two new commissioners. So I'm the most seasoned person in the Cabell County Commission with five years under my belt. Um, but we do have um, Liza Caldwell. She's one of our new county commissioners that's here today. And John Mant, he's our second new county commissioner, one of your former um, colleagues. And I would like to say that uh, it is his 60th birthday today. <laughs> so we can get back to I celebrate my 60th in July, so he, he beat me to it. Um, I'd also like to introduce, we have another, lot, lots of new, like I said, in Cabell County. We have our new county administrator, Ben Newhouse. 
And we also um, just hired for the very first time in Capital County a great writer. And so we have Charles Walker. He just started on Monday. And we realized that there's a lot of untapped potential financially out there that other counties are getting. And we decided to go ahead and take that step and try to uh, bring in some revenue um, into Capital County. So I'd like to um, thank them for being here um, as well. Um, Capital County is getting into the 21st century. Um, when I first came on board, we decided to um, go with open checkbook. Um, so we are up and running with the auditor's open checkbook initiative. So we are um, very transparent. We started live streaming our meetings. So if you ever get bored in your respective districts, tune in. We meet uh, the second and fourth Thursday of every month at 10 a.m. So tune in and, and see what's happening in Campbell County. We do have a Facebook page now, and we are getting ready to launch our new website. And we have um, just passed recently the Unsafe Building Structure Ordinance. And so we're going to be able at the county level to do what the city has done in trying to clean up our county of um, dilapidated structures. So lots of good things happening in, in Campbell County. Um, we do operate on an $18 million budget for general revenue, so it's a lot different from the state budget that you get to um, have. We have to pay our jail costs, we have to run the county, pay our employees, health care, and also um, running the courthouse. And as you see, we have the scaffolding is on the courthouse dome, and so we finally have been able through ARPA funds to, to address some um, you know, great concerns with our beautiful courthouse. Um, the chairman, Chris, had called me and said, hey, I want you to come and present. And he said I was going to be following the, the mayor. And that's where a lot of the economic development is taking place within the city of, of Huntington. But, um, you know, Cabell has a good, rich history. Um, and, and Chairman Chris wanted me to tell the story of Cabell County and um, how amazing it is. And when you all go on the, on the road um, to look at other um, counties, um, it's important to tell those stories. But the history of Cabell County is that we became a county in 1809. And we were part of uh, Kanawha County, and it was still in Virginia, and we were named in honor of William H. Cavill. He was a member of the General Assembly of Virginia, and he also was the governor of Virginia. So we did come from Kanawha and Virginia, but we are um, a robust county. It's um, part of our demographics. We have a population of around 93,000 people, with the largest population consisting of persons under the age of 18. They make up 19.9% of our um, population in Cavill County, barely edging out in the category of persons 65 years and older at 19.3%. So most of our people in Cabell County are 18 and under. 50.9% um, of our population is made up of females, edging, edging out the male population. So girl power, you know, for the ladies here in the audience. And our median household income in Cabell County is $43,779. And our unemployment rate is uh, resting now at 3.1%. Um, West Virginia has had a transformation. Um, I know like the foundation was laid by the legislators of the past and last night I was able to reminisce with many of you sitting around at the dinner table and talking about the long hours on judiciary. Um, you know, for those that serve on judiciary, um, Delegate Summers, we spent many long nights, one o'clock in the morning, back at it at nine o'clock in the morning. And um, the legislature was able to pave the way and set the foundation um, we passed civil justice reforms, um, taking us off the judicial hellhole list. Um, we passed numerous regulatory reforms, <coughs> right to work, and tax reforms. So the foundation has been laid. And now with the, my former colleagues and those that have joined your ranks with the new faces around the table, they're taking West Virginia and Cabell County to the next level. And it's so exciting to see that the fruits of the labor are starting to bear fruit. Um, West Virginia was continuously overlooked. You know, we just didn't even make the site selectors list. And until these nails of the economic coffin have been taken out one by one, we are now not only competing for economic opportunities with the help of you, we're leading the way um, and Cabell County is ripe for, for development. Um, with your schedule with legislative interns and Marshall University has done a great job to show you a good time and show off our city and our county. But you know, you have a lot of meetings. We thought we'd take you on a virtual tour and a virtual journey of Cabell County. And this is going to be the first part of the county um, presentation. After I'm done taking you on a little tour of Cabell County um, virtually, we'll have um, John Stump. He is the vice president of PADCO, and that's our economic development um, you know, engine here in Cabell County. And he's Jeff Cohen Johnson, and uh, he's going to do the second part of our county presentation. Um, but for now, we're going to, we have a lot of um, transportation arteries coming into Cabell County. We have Route 6, or I-64, Route 
10, Route 60, and Route 2. And so our first stop is going to be, if you were coming into Cabell County from, say, like Charleston, you're going to find Kaluton, and that's the eastern part of Cabell County. And we're very excited to have the I-64 interchange, and many of you played a big part in that. Um, the $32 million investment is anticipated to open in um, the fall of 2026, and we really think that it's going to um, bring in increased development in the eastern part of our county. So then if you venture down Route 60, you're going to enter into Milton. And we have three municipalities in Cabell County. We have Milton, we have Barbersville, and we have Huntington. And that's one of our um, one of our three municipalities. Um, Milton, um, we really want to thank you for the part you played in the Milton flood wall. Um, we had for Senator Pongle and Delia Limple, and we and all of you were very grateful for that because you know continuous flooding is not good for business, it's not good for residents, and we think that this is going to decrease insurance rates um, once it's completed. Um, we'd like for you to come back um, in October, in the fall, we have the Pumpkin Festival. There are 45,000 um, visitors that come to the Pumpkin Festival. Everything pumpkin, ice cream, fudge, everything pumpkin. Um, but 45,000 come to that little tiny town in Milton every year of a population of 2,800. So the population greatly increases um, during that time. Um, then, uh, glass, I think some of you might be going on, on that tour. Um, West Virginia was once known as the glass making industry. Um, there were um, 400 producers at one time, and Blinko was one of the last surviving fa um, glass factories, and it's rich in history. So if you have a chance, go down there and take that tour. It's very eye opening. Um, and then the Grand Patrician. Uh, I'm not sure if you've heard about this, but the Grand Patrician was the former polio hospital um, for children, and it turned into a nursing home, and it laid dormant for many years. And this is exciting because the county commission. Um, in December of 2018, we passed some, approved some TIF bonds and plans are underway for a full service resort. It's going to have a wedding chapel, convention center, 4,000 square foot spa, and a retirement facility, an amphitheater, resort villas, condo units, and single family homes. And we just cut the ribbon for the walking trail, 2.1 miles, and also the golf course will be open, I think, next week. Um, then you venture down Route 60 to Ona. Ona is home of the Oda Speedway, then they'll be celebrating the 51st anniversary. Uh, we are getting ready to cut next week the ribbon to the Sheriff's new field office in Ona. And uh, we were also pleased to have the Speaker of the House and the Senate President and others, um, even the Governor, I think Baby Dog came too, um, for the ribbon cutting of the State of the Art, Art Pepsi Distribution Center um, in Ona. Um, so those are pictures. And then you venture on down Route 60, you will find the village of Barbersville, and it is, it is known as the best little village in West Virginia. Um, West, uh, Barbersville has come, become the shopping mecca of Cabell County. Um, there's a lot of opportunity. When the Big Bend Highway um, opened up, um, it really brought in some um, increased development. We have several shopping centers that have um, been built around that corridor. Um, we have Canyon Station, Merritt's Creek Farm, River Place, and the Honey the Mall has been there for quite a number of years. Um, Barbersville is home to the Fall Fest, the West Virginia Veterans Home, and we are co-host of a national soccer tournament with the participation of 260 team, teams, 4,500 athletes that come from 13 states. So that's uh, really a, a great accomplishment for the little village of Barbersville. Uh, Mayor Williams has already highlighted um, the Huntington, but where would we be in Cabell County without Marshall University? without our hospital system um, and our riverfront opportunity, opportunities with the Huntington Symphony. Um, now we're going to venture down to the west of Huntington and you will find the Central City area. We have a wonderful antique district. If time allows, we'd love for you to go down there. Uh, we have a farmer's market called the Wild Ramp and it's an innovative food cooperative that supports our farm to table movement. It's become very popular. Um, in Cabell County. And then we close out our tour, our virtual tour, as we head down Route 2, and that's home to Alcon, and it's a world-renowned Huntington um, uh, originating business. And if you've had cataract surgery like myself, your lenses probably came from there. Um, they do all kinds of different um, innovative vision products, and so that's on Route 2. And also um, Green Acres, Sage Natural Water, they have won international awards, and it's from an aquifer. Um, it's, it's very good tasting water. I'm, I'm not sure if you have time to go down there, but they um, employ intellectually disabled individuals, and they have for decades. 
and it's supported through a levy that the county commission puts forth by the voters and the voters approve it um, each time. Um, and then route two, um, I know Mr. Musgrave is going to talk to you about uh, new core and the exciting opportunities that um, goes with that. Um, we're excited about new core as well. Um, it may not be in, in Cabell County, and I know Mason County, that's going to be a game changer for the county commission. And I sometimes wish <laughs> maybe we, you know, we could join Mason County on a few things because it's going to be a game changer for Mason County. But, you know, we're there to support them. Um, you know, we're going to have a lot of increased housing opportunities um, because of Newport. Um, but the county commission has partnered uh, with Cuyahoga Interstate Planning Commission. We just did this this past month. And we're the project sponsor um, at the commission for the proposed bridge crossing study. And that's going to be the first step to connect the eastern part of Cabell County with Ohio. And with the new core, all the transportation needs that are going to be addressed, that's going to be a gateway right there. And so um, we're in the first stages of that, but we think that's going to be done hopefully in my lifetime or sooner. Um, and then also, um, <coughs> Okay, I'm going to put a different hat on. Um, we've also partnered as a county commission with Advantage Valley, and you have on your on your tables, there's a um, publication that Advantage Valley puts out, and Cabell County has partnered um, with that. Um, but Advantage Valley came to the county commission last week, and they wanted us to um, partner with them on a housing study. And housing is a huge um, part of the equation for recruiting companies and employees to locate here. And as, a, as part of my other hat, I've been a licensed realtor here in the area for 25 years, and I have been blessed to work with about a dozen Newport families. They're coming from Brazil, they're coming from Florida, Alabama, Arkansas, the Carolinas, and they tell me, we love it here. We love the people. We, we think that you know everybody's been so welcoming and kind. And so as a realtor who has worked with numerous families trying to find it, our inventory is very low at, at the moment. And it's that way nationwide. It's not just in our market. And so we really need to put our heads together collectively and figure out how we can get infrastructure dollars for housing. You know, you have developers who are willing to make that investment and to have new construction, but it's those upfront dollars, you know, water, sewer, um, and utilities. And so that's something that we really do need to get um, ahead of. Um, now rather than later. So why, why Cabell County, you might ask? What do we have to offer? Well, Cabell County has it all. We have the quality of life, we have the quality of our people, and whether you desire a metropolitan lifestyle, living in one of the condos here in Huntington, or you want to live in the country, out near Salt Rock, on a farm, or you want to enjoy the small town village feel of Barbersville, or you even want to live in one of our several planned communities for retirement, Cabell County offers all of that within a 20 minute drive you know, throughout the county. Employees desire good schools, arts and entertainment, parks and recreation, access to health care, transportation, river, rail and roads and public transportation, safe communities, and businesses desire an educated and trained workforce. And here's where Cabell County can play a big part with new core and beyond. We are the educational piece that I think is necessary for um, increased um, you know, industry. Our region has, um, can be in, uh, integral for training workers, not only for Newport, but for other companies. We have a major university, a community and technical college. We have a new vocational and technical training facility that's being um, built at the Huntington Mall for the public school system. And we have the newly um, uh, named Marshall University Advanced Manufacturing Center, and that's going to become the home of a welding educational facility in the ACS property. So Cabell County does have it all, and we want to partner with you. Um, you know, we have, um, you know, one ask. If I have to have one ask, we do need to have Route 2 expansion into the four lanes. We only have a two-lane road from Huntington all the way up towards Point Pleasant, and it's very important to get that expansion so that we can have those downstream opportunities in Huntington. So if we have to ask for one thing, we ask for Route 2 expansion dollars. Uh, to come into to Cabell County. And so with that, um, you know, Cabell County partners with the Cuyahoga Interstate Planning Commission. The three commissioners are members of that, the Region 2 Planning Commission. And um, one of the other partnerships that we do have is with CADCO, and that's the Huntington Area Development Council. And I am pleased to introduce John Stump. He is an attorney with Stepco and Johnson, and he is on the board. And 
he's going to tell you some exciting things going on in Cabot County with economic development. Thank you so much for being here. ADCO is our is the local economic development agency for Cabell and Wayne counties. Uh, everybody has this throughout your, your regions, uh, throughout your districts, and your local, various your counties have the local economic development agencies. That's what ADCO is. We're a little different. We're not for profit. We're not created under state law as, well, as most of the LEDs are, and we're funded through uh, the Cabell and Wayne County Commissions, the commissioners, Huntington and Barbersville. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, our own development revenues, and finally, private donations. We're actually primarily funded for private donations, whether it be businesses or individuals. Um, we're the only accredited economic development agency in the state. What is our purpose? What do local economic development authorities do? Well, at HADCO, our number one goal is site acquisition and development. Uh, secondly, what we call BR&E, which is existing business retention and expansion. And finally, new business attraction. We do have, I, I think, throughout Cabell County, I have the, the good fortune to work throughout the state. And I think that in Cabell County, we have excellent cooperation among the various entities uh, in the economic development realm. These are the various groups that we work with. There are others, which include, obviously, lo the local governments. Um, Marshall University, of course, is a huge driver throughout Cabell County in the region. So let's talk about site acquisition. I don't know, um, in my experience, if you don't have site control, you don't have anything. When we start talking about locating new businesses or expanding existing businesses. I don't know how many of you are aware that Toyota was originally supposed to go in Cabell County. And it was down to, they had a site identified, it was ready to be announced, and the property owner said no. Wouldn't sell the farm for Toyota to locate. So there was a Hail Mary pass by the, develop, by the development office and they landed in, uh, in Buffalo. So again, if you don't have site control, you don't have anything. Uh, until you have that, you're just, just talking. Um, we don't compete with private developers. Our goal is to step in where private development is not taking the risk. So thank you to our banks and also the West Virginia Development Office, EDA, and Infrastructure Council for being um, for being uh, capital providers for us, realizing that uh, we're, we're not bankable in some instances. We also assist with infrastructure installation and expansion and facilitating brownfield development. BRE, business retention and expansion. This is uh, in my in what they say is you get 80% of your new business from 20% um, of your customers. It's much easier to expand an existing business, and of course we want to retain our existing businesses, than it is to bring in a new business. We have several businesses here in the area which are looking at expansions and manufacturing, um, and generally we attempt to help them through various methods, whether it's finding funding for those expansions, infrastructure again becomes an issue, uh, and liaison between existing businesses and government, identifying programs for them and helping them uh, take advantage of those programs. Finally, business attraction. This is what gets all of the all the attention and sounds great and wonderful announcements. Uh, we're attending eight national trade shows and then we database of properties. So really you put the infrastructure in place. It's all about infrastructure, right? Put the infrastructure in place to allow economic development to occur. So the site consultant looks for a property in Cabell County. They're able to go to a website and the information is there. So some recent successes uh, of HADCO and in Cabell County, uh, we sold the entirety of the HADCO business park, remaining 80 acres. So that park is occupied by Alcon on the one hand and also now by Trueleaf, which is a uh, one of the grow facilities for cannabis. Um, about 150 jobs, investment of $30 million. And the infrastructure there, that park was developed utilizing tax increment financing. That was a situation where we used the property increment generated by Alcon to purchase additional property, put in water and sewer infrastructure, um, and be able to develop that property. 
You'll see this property if you're going on the Newport trip today, up route two, you'll see this on the left hand side just past the sage, as Commissioner Sagonia mentioned. This is a tremendous economic development opportunity that's been made, made possible by the legislature. Um, P Ridge Public Service District, which is out in the Barbersville area, provides sewer service in that area. Uh, they are extending sewer service from the Barbersville area, actually right near Kroger, down, down the Marriage Creek connector, Old Marriage Creek Road to Route 2. That's going to pick up about 750 residential customers. There's also eight industries that have been operating along Route 2 that don't have public sanitary sewer. So why is that? Why is that a big deal? Well, if I'm a manufacturer, I'm I'm in it's my business. My business is almost certainly not running a wastewater treatment plant, right? I don't want to be a permitted NPDE, have an NPDES permit. That's not my business. That's not what I do. I'm happy to pay for somebody to provide the utility, but I don't want to have to provide that service. So this is a tremendous development. It's going to open up the Marriage Creek connector to high density housing or high, potentially commercial, but most likely housing, which is desperately needed, as we've heard. Um, and this was made possible through the funding that you all made to the Western Water Development Authority for uh, infrastructure. Without that funding, this project would not move forward. Uh, and also the Capital County Commission designated a significant portion of their ARPA funds to infrastructure, water sewer, or sewer infrastructure throughout the county, including this project. That project is going out to bid hopefully in the next month. Um, and those industries all wrote letters when we were looking for the funding supporting the project. They're very excited about it. It will also open up the area around the proposed bridge that Commissioner Sabonia just mentioned. It will open up that area there uh, for, again, more high density development. Finally, the Palmer Alliance Zone uh, partnered with HADCO. Uh, this Palmer Alliance Zone bought a 360,000 square foot building that's in downtown Huntington. It was the old Hudai Industries building, is what I'm told, which predates me. Uh, to get an idea of 360,000 square feet, that's a, that's a little more than two super Walmarts. Okay, 360,000 square feet with 40 foot high ceilings rail access, industrial scale utilities. This is an incredibly unique facility that needs a little work, needs cleaned up, but um, we had the railroad in there to look at it and they said, there's nothing like this along our service lines that's available. Now, half of it is presently leased, but the other 180,000 square feet roughly are, are on the market and we've already had a significant interest in that property. So that's a that again, that's a situation where you have site control. Palmer Alliance Zone bought the property for seven and a half million dollars. And since we're right here, we're helping them market it. Future successes. This is what's coming. Um, we have a eight acre site in the city of Huntington that was donated to NADCO because it had by the Board of Education, it was old practice fields, had some environmental issues on it. Um, we've gone in and remediated those issues. Again, private sector wasn't interested in doing that. And uh, we currently have a purchaser for the site under negotiation. So that's a role that we serve is that brownfields remediation. Again, as the mayor referenced where um, you, you have to turn these properties over because most of Huntington was manufactured. In reality, man, Huntington's unique, I believe, in most of the municipalities in West Virginia. We have heavy manufacturing in the city limits. With Steel of West Virginia and Special Metals, which is adjacent to the city, you're, you're talking about major manufacturing, heavy manufacturing operations. We have another existing manufacturer, um, it's a West Virginia based business, looking at a $20 million investment, they need 40, about 40 new jobs. They need a water line. They, don't, they need a water line for the expansion in order to service fire flows. So we're helping them apply for that, apply for that water line. Uh, apparently, I repeated that one. Tri-State Regional Airport, you can see on the map there, the Tri-State Regional Airport has 90 acres. It's pretty flat, but it needs water, sewer, and road in order to be truly expanded. Um, that's the site. It is under control happily by the FAA and the airport, but that's the type of site that we 
we're looking to develop um, for you know something in the airline industry. So, what are so um, Mr. Savonia made one ask. I'm going to make two. Um, first, funding for site acquisition and development. Of course, you all provided those funds this year with site acquisition site acquisition funds, site development monies. That's crucial. Uh, we have, we're looking at additional properties. We don't have sites. It's just, it's not with, not a ready to go, not with water, sewer, and roads. And you can look at the new core site. That's a perfect example. For those of you that remember, we talked about putting a paper mill there in 95. So we've known at least since 95, that that was one of the prime industrial sites in the state. And now today, uh, and well, in the last two years, this group has committed to putting the necessary funds there to build the wastewater treatment plant, which is costing roughly $24 million, and I'm sure 10 years ago would have cost half that. So anyway, um, finally is incentivizing regionalization. We do operate in Wayne County. Um, I think we all agree regionalization is can be important. So. We'd like to see incentivization from the legislature for regionalization of local economic development groups. That's all I have. Thank you for your time. I'm happy to take any questions. Any questions for John or for Alex? Mr. Chairman, wait. Just one question. What, um, what makes you different than the other local, local economic development groups? I know you, you brag about some. Uh, accreditation, but well, primarily we're not for profit. We're not. Most local economic development agencies are created under West Virginia Code 712, so they're actually a public corporation. So, for example, their board has to be appointed by whoever. Every, well, the board is appointed by the county commissioner of the municipality that creates them, and the code section mandates that who is on that board. So, example, if you're a county local economic development group, the board includes the mayor of every municipality in that county. So it's just a different, it, it, in my experience, it's somewhat more streamlined. It's not that a 712 can't do a good job. They do. I mean, the vast majority of them do a great job. It's just a different structure. And the private and the private donations as, as primary funding source is different. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> Uh, well, first of all, a statement. I'm, I'm impressed with your emphasis on infrastructure. I just think that's that's the secret to, to all of the development, uh, yours and the, and the city's. I'm wondering about housing and whether you all will be using the, the WB Bill program with the 20 square mile uh, housing districts. If you all are in that state. Yes. Yes, there are, there are developers that are, are, have already talked to, I know, Talk to Hadco about it. It's housing really isn't in our wheelhouse. Um, we just don't have enough staff to do everything. But I, you will see the West Virginia Build Act and application submitted. I'm, I'm certain from the city and/or Cabell County, or maybe a joint application. Some downtown developers in Huntington, who I've spoken with, are very interested in the act. Well, I really like the uh, your regional approach, and I would say that we passed the bill. Uh, this session where any municipality and county commission can join together for a particular service. And, and I'm wondering, is that could that be a tool for you all? Because you seem to have a, a bent toward the regional rather than just local. Absolutely. I, I'm familiar with the bill. Um, yes, that's going to be excellent for specific projects. I think it has a lot of upside. The regional wastewater uh, and, and the regional Utility Authority Act you all passed as well is another opportunity for regionalization, uh, not specific for economic development, but certainly does provide that type of mechanism. The more tools you have in the tool chest, you know, the better the opportunities. Thank you. Sir. I can add to that as well. Um, Advantage, Advantage Valley, um, they, there's 10 different counties that they cover. There's 10 different counties that Advantage Valley covers, and Cabell County is one of those. And when we partnered with them last week in one of our county commission meetings, we are part and a partner with this housing study. And I think that that's going to give us a lot of answers as to where the housing needs are. And so that's going to be one step. So we're excited to get those um, results back from that. Thank you. 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 Th
So, and we're in the process now of um, in, in the coming year to we're going to be revamping our strategic and comprehensive plan for the county. And absolutely, housing is going to be a major part of our strategic plan moving forward. We're in the past before this, um, I don't call it a crisis, but this low inventory situation. Um, we're going to have to make sure that that's going to be a big part of our strategic plan for Cap County. I, I congratulate you and, and, and your service and success. This has been a great presentation. I'd like to see this this presentation made in other parts of the state. Thank, Thank you for being here. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Mr. Sedonia, I have a question just on that on the bridge. And it's just, um, I'm not familiar, as I should be probably, with what's on the other side of that bridge in Ohio over there. So, you know, one of the things with, with bringing large infrastructure um, up and down Route 2 or whatever those with new going new for itself, the investment states made, is there any concern that, you know, that the population that we can draw on the West Virginia to have housing up and close to that, that we just beat that over to Ohio because of giving easy access to housing over there? I don't know what their infrastructure's like. Why would we open that up over there to them, I guess, is the question. It's actually, um, in my experience, you know, putting on my hat as a, as a realtor, um, the families I'm working with that are coming in from all over the country and the world, they want to be in West Virginia. So I haven't had not one person out of the dozen that I've helped that want to look over to Ohio. They like our amenities here. That's, that's my point. That's my point. Why, why make it easy access so that it is? Well, I just think that, that it's thought. going to um, they create a transportation, you know, cloud, so to speak. And I think that any time that you have access, because even like for our own people in West Virginia, um, if you want to go to Ohio, you have to either go down to a Huntington or you have to go up to Point Pleasant. There's nothing in the eastern part of Cabell County to connect interstate commerce. And I think it's all about interstate commerce that we need to be thinking about. Moving goods and services. So I, I think figured that was probably the spot. But I was curious about the housing aspect because I was thinking about all the people around that. So, the so far, they, just, they want to stay in, in West Virginia. That's my personal experience. So we want to keep it that way. Questions? All right, next presenter is John Mustard. John is executive director of the Mason County Development Fund. And he's had a lot of past titles. If you had John, I think there's a lot of people here that probably know what some of those past titles are, but if you don't mind, kind of let them know. So I've been very blessed uh, in my career. I started out as uh, starting an industry from scratch uh, in Point Pleasant. And at that time, we had opportunities and contracts with Disney World and X Store, if you remember X and those type things. And then President Carter put on the oil embargo, and we couldn't get, we couldn't buy our product except by tank car. We didn't have a railing, so we had to close that. I was asked then to take over as mayor of the city of Point Pleasant which I did and really enjoyed and got to know all the mayors, got to know your mayor here across the state. Had the privilege of being the president of the West Virginia Mayors Association. And then was asked to go with the federal government and I did that. Uh, it was in bit of USDA here in West Virginia, Farmers Home, many of you we were lending agencies coal mine car agencies and various things. And then uh, I uh, was asked to come to Washington to help start the Rural Development Administration. And uh, so I did that and retired. And back to the state, and the governor asked me to take over the lottery, and I did that. And then uh, another governor asked me if I would go in for revenue secretary, and I'm so in this. Uh, Secretary Hardy and Mark, when I used to come before the committees here, both House and Senate, we were talking deficit mm -hmm. and uh, what to do. And so, so good to to hear what's going on today. They do a great job. Well, I'm here and been asked to come and talk about New Corps, Mason County. I think you're going to take a trip up that way tomorrow, some of you, and take a look. Uh, Nucor is a major, major project. 
I've been in development a long time, and if we had to pick a company, if we could pick it from the top three or four, Nucor would be the one to pick. Nucor is a started out as a $2.7 billion capital investment, and it has increased. I heard the other day from the plant manager that they're approaching $3 billion now. They're kind of in a whole pattern waiting for environmental uh, permits that are needed. This plant, this steel plant for Nucor is going to be one of the largest in North America at this time. It's going to be a very, very modern facility. Matter of fact, if you can imagine, it's going to have the largest electric furnace in the world. Started up with flipping the switch, closing it down with the switch. It's going to be the largest steel plant of its kind uh, in, like I said, North America and possibly the world. It's going to employ about 1,500 to 2,000 construction uh, once they get started. Now imagine that. Mason County is 26,000 people, Point Pleasant is about 5,000. And so we're going to have an influx of those folks. We talked about housing. What are we going to do on housing? And we're part of the Vantage Valley Housing, I said, on their board. And we're doing a study with 10 other counties to see about what we can do with county from the entire area. You've heard here with the other speakers that we've talked about working together in regionalism, and we certainly have that. And we looked at Huntington, of course, as a major source, Marshall University, and Bitco. We have a great relationship here in this region. But this this company will employ about 800 full-time workers to start. It'll then increase once they're in production to about a thousand employees. And uh, then once the, the, you get into production, probably about two years out, two, three years out, they'll start inching up a little bit. And we hope that the full employment will be around 1,200 full time employees. Uh, this uh, site, started out as being a 1,400 acre site. And John said that it had been looked at numerous times. And that brings up something that I heard here today earlier from every speaker. And I was asked this question uh, on the street the other day. One of my friends said, hey, I've been meaning to ask you. He said, you know, we've had these sites in Mason County. We've got several. They're over a thousand acres. They have water and sewer. One of them has uh, phase one, phase two environmental, where we plan and working trying to get somebody here. And he said, we've had the two railroads. We've had two rivers. We have a good transportation system. We have all the infrastructure. Why are things just happening now? Why haven't we been able to get something in the last 10 or 20 years? And I've heard that here today. We're getting started. We're doing things. What happened in that? Well, in thinking about that, I told him, I said, you know, <coughs> one of the main things happened is when the legislative body got with the administration and they took a look at development and said, how are we going to compete? not only in the national market, but the international market. And you got together, the credit goes to you folks in the administration. You got together and said, we've got to do something with the state development office to give it the horsepower that it needs. And so you selected to move it up to a captain position and you selected a great team, Secretary Carmichael, Rainy, to take it over, and then you provided the funding that has been necessary for years to make it a first class operation. Those folks are doing a fantastic job. And I told this person 
that uh, the credit goes, I think, to you here today. You're the procreation of dollars, and you're the ones that make this happen. Well, as I said, Newport's not only has the largest furnace, largest steel plant, but you know what? They're the, also they're the largest recycle company. They recycle. Just think of this. They recycle everything they make. You make steel, you can put it back into the system. So they're, they do a great job in recycling. They're largest in North America. And of course, they're one of the top companies, I think, in the nation. Uh, we couldn't have a better relationship than we have with this company. When they first arrived in, I saw that almost a year ago now, to Point Pleasant, and we were having a get together, and the corporate people were there. They brought a million dollar check, and they gave it to Grace County Schools. And then they had another $250,000 check that they presented to the food bank. And not only did they do that, but now they've assigned a few of their workers to be at those food banks and help load the cars those people that are coming and are in need. This company also believes in, uh, in a uh, profit sharing plan. They pay a major wage uh, for that, for the work that they have done to their labor force. And then they provide profit sharing. And I'm told that through the profit sharing, sometimes the check will be greater than the Ireland check. The wages, uh, I think the average throughout the new four system is over $100,000 a year for employees. Of course, uh, and they just, it just depends on how the profits uh, go. But they do share that with their, their employees. Well, it's an outstanding company. You know, you can appreciate a company when it comes in and it blends into the fabric of the community. And they've certainly done that in every sense of the word. They not only are active in Point Pleasant and Mason County, but they're down in Huntington and Cabell County. They're taking advantage of Putnam County into Kanawha County. We've realized with this plant coming in, what it's going to bring. They're going to have about a thousand contractors working on this job. So all of a sudden, we get this coming in. And you ask the right question, what are you going to do about housing? Well, what we did is I read an article uh, in a couple of years ago. If you remember out in the Dakotas, they were putting in the pipelines out there. They had people sleeping in barns. They were rural areas like we have. And, uh, they were having a real problem. And I read that they brought in this company that brings in temporary housing. You can look at the storms type or barracks type. And but they have recreation, they have a cafeteria, they have good parking. And so I contacted them and I said, you know, we're bringing in this large company into our little rural county. And uh, maybe that you could solve our problem. Well, they were interested and we put them together with Nucor and they are building out now on private <coughs> property, private by venture, uh, a unit about 300 they're starting with, to bringing this in and fix it where the, these workers are going to be coming in, the laborers to build this plant. Now, we have a lot of construction folks that have their own trailers and they take it. Trailer parks are just blossoming in Mason County. Uh, we're blessed. Uh, Mason County used to have, I think it still does, more miles of water line than any county in the state. So we've been blessed by putting in infrastructure back years ago. And so we're working on the housing. We're working on permanent housing. And uh, we had an opportunity, Newport did something else that was very helpful. In all county, Bitco participated in this, so did Putnam County. 
but they brought in their middle manager. We had it here, Marshall University across the street, and the university hosted it, but they brought in their middle manager and people that they were interested in bringing here to West Virginia. They asked their wives. Uh, in fact, they took them to a football game. And we did and set it up. We had an opportunity to sit with those folks and say, come to West Virginia. We want you to come and be part of our community. And we all three, Putnam County, Page County, Cattle County, had a, had a visit with all of these folks. You know, it was interesting. What we had was we had the top management that was looking to come in, possibly go to a community or go to the valley. And a lot of them had the moving allowances and so forth. But when we got down to talk to the workers, they wanted a place that they could put a couple of dogs out in the backyard and let them run, have a little garden, uh, be out. So we were getting a lot of conversation on the different levels that come into your community. Of course, we know in this area, we have a lot of that type of acreage that we can make available. Well, we're now, uh, I wanted to bring out that uh, I think you're going down to Newport, go by and the plant manager is, is excited to have you there and to take a look at uh, that property. It's a great problem. Why did it look good there after all these years? Well, there's several reasons. We were ready. John mentioned that we got money to put in a sewer system first. That's what we were lacking. We had water. We had other things, but we got sewer. So we did that through a grid. That's being constructed now. But one of the keys was that this was a effort not only by the state development office, did such a great job. But Appalachian Power Company, uh, they own the site. They've always been a good partner uh, in our county. And so they were interested in bringing in a major company and they've been holding back that site. And this new core company is the company. And so we, it was a working together, not only of industry, but business. Well, I want to kind of jump just a little bit now, and Mr. Chairman, you stop me whenever, but we're also working on two other major projects up in Mason County, and I can't talk too much about them because of the agreement that I've signed, but I can tell you that both of them have options property. <coughs> One of them is looking at 200 acres and We've been working on it now for a while. They told me we just recently they're about ready to make an announcement. It'll take some old technology, but they have improved it. They filed patents. They have patent rights, and I forget how many different countries. Uh, once they get the process up and running, they plan to bring people from those areas that they, I guess, franchise the operation to come and be part of Mason County. And it's quite a complex that they're talking about. And then right beside of it, we have another site. It's about 1,100 acres. And we have a large company right now that has taken an option on that property. And they've already made a down payment, uh, which is unusual. And uh, they're looking to bring in a company I guess an industry that will be capital investment uh, about the sum of new or maybe even more. Uh, it's very exciting. We have that going on. And then if you go right across the border from Mason County on the east side, you uh, are very far from uh, the uh, Berkshire Hathaway plant going over in Jackson County. Matter of fact, from this site I was just telling you about, it's only about old 25 minutes uh, between the, the sites. So in the southern part of Mason County, down here along, not too far from Huntington here, we're having new core, 2.73 billion operation with 
large employment. We're looking at almost the same in the north part about 20 plus major industry. A little bit further from that is the Berkshire Hathaway project. So what's the problem? It's great to have it. <coughs> we've got all kinds of problems. We've got housing problems, we got road problems, we got traffic problems, we've got water and sewer problems. And as the commissioner has said here, and we've got many other unseen issues. And so we know those are critical and we've gone to work. I might add that uh, in my office, there's just me and a secretary. So we have a time right now keeping up with everything. But I want you to use your imagination and I want you to picture this. And this is not original with me. This has been proposed by one of your colleagues years ago served uh, in the Senate. This idea, Brooks McCabe, I don't know whether some of you know Brooks McCabe, yes, and different things. But this was a conversation we were having 10 or 12 years ago in General for Development. And this was, if you picture this, a taking a line from Charleston to North County, go through Putman County, go down and take in Jackson County to the river and then go south from that along the river and down to Point Pleasant uh, and then from Point Pleasant down the river to Huntington and then bring that line back up through Wayne County into Wayne County up a little bit of Lincoln County and then bring it on into Charleston. You've got a golden triangle. And this triangle, just think of this now. This triangle has two of the largest cities in it that we have in the state of West Virginia. This triangle has, in Point Pleasant, in Huntington, in Charleston, has two major rail systems. Point Pleasant, we have switching, we can switch, we have CSX North and South uh, that run here. We can ship product to Newfork, Norfolk, to one of the biggest ports on the East Coast. We can ship by, by barge in the port of Huntington, used to be the largest in the inland waterway. We can ship out of Point Pleasant, we have, we've got the river division up there. We can move on. We can. Uh, and then, look at within that triangle, you've got the aluminum plant in Jackson County. You don't have Berkshire Hathaway. You don't have these plants in Mason County, I've been referring to. You've got Newport. You've got the plants you heard about down here in Huntington. You've, uh, you've got two major rivers. Uh, when you look at it, You've got a highway system that really, on, even on the East Coast, is almost second to none within this triangle. You've got 64, you've got 77, you've got 79, and now what you all created, we finished Route 35. And Route 35 is the main connector from our capital in Charleston to the Ohio capital in Columbus. It takes from Point Pleasant just about an hour and 10, 15 minutes to get to the Columbus International Airport. And then we have two airports here within that strike of Charleston. If we looked at it and did our planning and looked at future development, what we could create in this region, working together, as you've heard here today, this would be a powerhouse in the state of this. We have in this room where we're called to make that happen. We need your help. You've heard about financing, you've heard about Route 2 is a terrible, terrible road. Uh, you'll see some of it, I think, when you get up. It's pretty good in Pebble County, but we should be secure. 
but we need your help and we need your assistance. So I appreciate we've got a great delegation from Mason County to do a fantastic job for us in the legislature. And I tell you, I uh, congratulate you folks for your foresight in funding the development office, creating cabinet position, giving uh, Secretary Carmichael the tools that he needs to get things And so I'm hopeful that uh, we can bring all that we've talked about to fruition. I uh, appreciate so much the thing of working with everybody to make that. And I'm sorry. Do we have any uh, questions for Mr. Musker? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, first of all, Nucor, uh, I'll make one brief comment. And full disclosure, I've owned shares in Nucor in a long time. Got their, uh, just to tell you what type of company is, I've never seen these. Their annual report this year listed the name of each employee. Just to get back to how important their employees are and how much they give back to their employees. I think it'll be a fantastic report. Now, it's my understanding that besides the 1,300 acres they acquired from AEP, they, Newport, have acquired another 1,700 acres in the immediate proximity. So they're up to about 3,000 acres of land now that's developable there. But would you speak, I, I think you hit the, you're, you're, you're really hitting the nail on the head. Could you speak to the importance, given what is coming, of a four lane, Route to from the Big Bend Bowen Highway up to 35, and then hopefully on to the Berkshire Hathaway property or in that proximity to tie into 77. I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Well, of course, you know, you, you've got to move commerce, you've got to have, take Newport, for example. There, the rolls of steel, I don't know whether you've seen them moving on the highway, but you can only put one roll of steel on a vehicle, on a truck. So heavy. And so you're going. We're going to have a lot of truck traffic. Their plan is to. Uh, this was a twofold uh, proposal with Newport. My understanding is they're going to build. They've got a warehouse that's going to be built up in the district. They'll be moving products up there. I think their service areas for auto and appliances up in the northeast. But it's critical that we have the highway. Uh, and even build on the, I guess, the excellent system that we have now. But when they looked at it, as I said, to move product, you got the interstates, you got Route 35 now, and uh, so it's, it's critical that we have a highway system, particularly if we can link up this route to take it on up to uh, Reagan. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mine is, uh, Mr. Chairman, is more of a comment to all the presenters. When we're talking about infrastructure, one thing that was lacking today, this is going to bring a, a world of difference into all these areas. My fear is, are we paying enough attention to the um, emergency services and beefing up that area before it's needed and hoping it's never needed? But if we don't do something for all the areas of emergency service, which already are strained, we're going to have a catastrophe. So I would just encourage everybody to put that on the radar screen and look at it. I, I, couldn't, I, I know from being a mayor years ago that how important those type of services are. So I would agree. I'll look to the co chairman. Mr. Chairman, I move we adjourn. Motion on the journal. Is it fair to say aye? Aye. 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 aye.